So, welcome to uh, lecture 2 of this uh, course on uh, uh, Riemann surfaces and algebraic curves. So, um, if you uh, recall uh, what we did in uh, lecture 1 was uh, to try to give the idea of what Riemann surface is and uh, in fact I promised in lecture 1 as one of the goals that I will also give some examples of Riemann surfaces which I could not do. So, I will essentially take it up in this lecture. So, let me again remind you uh, our idea, our idea is the following uh, our we want to start with a surface which uh, we can uh, visualize in uh, 3 dimensions. Uh, specific examples are of course, uh, uh, the sphere uh, or the uh, or the cylinder of course, this is the what I mean by the cylinder is the infinite cylinder uh, extending in both directions though I have drawn only a finite part of it here on the board and uh, the, the torus. So, these are all examples of surfaces that uh, we can visualize in, in, in three dimensional space and uh, what is it that we want to do? Uh, we want to be able to do complex analysis on the surface. So, uh, a Riemann surface uh, is a structure on such a surface which allows you to do complex analysis on that surface. So, uh, let me quickly recall uh, if you take if you call the surface as x okay, then uh, we say that uh, uh, x is equipped with the structure of a Riemann surface if uh, x is given a collection of charts of uh, complex coordinate charts complex coordinate charts which uh, I will denote by pairs u alpha p alpha where alpha runs over an indexing set i. Uh, such that the u alpha cover x. So, uh, u alpha is just an open cover of x and uh, that is the first condition. The second condition is of course, uh, uh, so I should mention here that u alpha are open sets <coughs> are open subsets of x. So, each u alpha is an open subset of x and all the u alphas for the various alphas they cover the surface uh, which is the same as saying that the union of the u alphas is x that is the first condition. The second condition is that phi alpha uh, is a map from u alpha into uh, the complex plane for each alpha such that uh, uh, this map has to be a topological isomorphism that is a homeomorphism onto an open subset of the complex plane which we call as v alpha. So, uh, phi alpha from u alpha to c is a homeomorphism of u alpha onto an open subset v alpha of c. And uh, this is to be thought of as uh, trying to give uh, every point in u alpha uh, this neighborhood u alpha uh, being uh, parameterized by a neighborhood on the complex plane. Okay. So, what you are doing is it by giving this homeomorphism you are you are making every point in u alpha acquire a complex coordinate because you take any point in u alpha you have a point 
uh, you take the image of that point under phi alpha you get a point of v alpha and v alpha any point in v alpha has uh, standard complex coordinates. So, this way each of these uh, coordinate maps okay uh, every every uh, chart consists of two data the first datum is an open set and the second datum is an identification of that open set with an open subset of the complex plane okay. So, the second one is called as a coordinate map and the whole thing together is called as a coordinate chart okay. So, uh, the uh, the essence of this is that every point in u alpha is uniquely identified with a point in the complex plane by phi alpha okay and then well the the third condition which is very very important is that uh, whenever u alpha and uh, u beta intersect then the the two charts u alpha comma phi alpha and u beta comma phi beta the two charts they have to be compatible okay the charts u alpha comma phi alpha and u beta comma phi beta have to be be compatible and what does compatibility mean I uh, uh, would uh, like you to recall from the first lecture that compatibility uh, is supposed to mean that when you try to define uh, the holomorphicity of a function on uh, uh, at a point on uh, the Riemann surface you do not want the holomorphicity to depend on the chart which you use to define define uh, which you use to uh, uh, give the definition of holomorph holomorphicity that is the, the a property such as holomorphicity must be an intrinsic property it should not depend on the chart that you use and therefore if a point belongs to two charts okay it, it belongs to two open sets that is in the intersection then uh, a function at that point its property of being holomorphic should not depend on the identification phi alpha which is given on u alpha or on the identification phi beta which is given on u beta it should be independent of the identification the the, the notion of holomorphicity should be a an intrinsic property okay and that is achieved by this compatibility and what is this compatibility uh, so uh, let me again uh, uh, draw a diagram to help you to recall so here is uh, so here is my u alpha and here is my u beta and well this is these are two open sets on the Riemann surface and we have from here this map phi alpha which is a homeomorphism on to a certain subset uh, which uh, I call as v alpha in the complex plane and there is another uh, homeomorphism phi beta which identifies u beta with again with uh, an open subset v beta on the complex plane. Of course uh, when I draw these these subsets need not really look like disks they could be general open sets but I am just drawing them as this so that it is easier it is easier for me to draw also. Uh, well now the point is that uh, uh, you take this intersection which is u alpha intersection u beta that is an open subset of u alpha as well as of u beta and uh, this intersection will be mapped by phi alpha into an open set here which uh, I, I call as uh, v uh, alpha beta that is the image of uh, that is phi alpha of u alpha intersection u beta and similarly this open subset u alpha intersection u beta is mapped onto a yeah, an open subset of v beta by phi beta and uh, that open subset I call it as v beta alpha which is just phi beta of u alpha intersection u beta and uh, what was the problem the problem was if I have a function f uh, which is defined on this intersection and taking complex values 
and if I have to uh, decide that this function is holomorphic then I have two ways of uh, saying that the function is holomorphic namely I can say f is holomorphic with respect to this identification with respect to this chart u alpha and phi alpha if the composite function from here to here which is given by first go by phi alpha inverse inverse and then apply f so this is the composite and of course here I mean phi alpha inverse is being applied to uh, this subset uh, v alpha beta okay so I am not writing it there I am just writing it uh, just like this so that it is the, the notation does not become complicated but remember that phi alpha is a homeomorphism of u alpha into v alpha so it is also a homeomorphism of uh, u alpha intersection u beta into v alpha beta okay so phi alpha inverse will map v alpha beta into u alpha intersection u beta okay so well uh, to say that f is holomorphic with respect to this chart u alpha comma phi alpha is to say that this map from an open subset of the complex plane to the complex plane this map this composition is uh, holomorphic and now I have another definition with respect to the other chart namely that well I can also have this composition which is uh, first apply phi beta inverse which will take uh, v beta alpha into u alpha intersection u beta and then compose it follow it up with f and I can now say that f is holomorphic with respect to this identification if f circle phi beta inverse is holomorphic and what I really do not want to happen is that it should not be that f is holomorphic with respect to one chart and not holomorphic with respect to the other chart that is it should not happen that this is holomorphic but this is not holomorphic okay I do not want such a conflict and that is because the idea of holomorphicity of a function should be intrinsic to the function it should not depend on any external factors okay. So it is something like this in, in linear algebra for example if you have a finite dimensional vector space you see no matter uh, what your basis is you do not expect the dimension to change the, the cardinality of a, any two bases uh, uh, are the same okay so it should not be that uh, 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 that is because the dimension of a space is something that is intrinsic okay it should depend only on the space and not the way you get at it and that is why uh, uh, we have the theorem that if you take uh, any two bases they have the same cardinality. So you see all these intrinsic things in mathematics uh, they should be defined in such a way uh, that is ambiguous uh, is, is not ambiguous okay. So holomorphicity is an intrinsic thing and you do not want that to be ambiguous okay and ambiguity will come in the moment you have two charts any two intersecting charts okay and a function defined on the intersection of those two charts. So how did we uh, uh, get past this condition this compatibility is uh, given by the following we require so uh, let me say compatibility PLT requires that uh, so I look at uh, this map namely I go from V alpha V beta alpha uh, and then I go all the way to V alpha beta so I, I take this map there is a map like this how do I get this map this map is well first apply phi beta inverse that will take v beta alpha into u alpha intersection u beta and then follow it by phi alpha okay and well you can call this as g alpha beta okay and of course this g alpha beta is a homeomorphism because phi beta inverse is a homeomorphism and phi alpha is a homeomorphism so it is a homeomorphism and uh, but you must understand that all this is only defined on uh, v beta alpha and it lands in v alpha beta okay. So if I have to be very strict here I have to write phi beta inverse restricted to v beta alpha and then instead of phi alpha I should write phi alpha restricted to u alpha intersection u beta I am not writing those restrictions because uh, then it will look very complicated okay. So uh, what is the compatibility requirement, requirement is it is that uh, this g alpha beta is holomorphic. this is the condition so the compatibility of of, of any two charts that uh, uh, whenever there are two charts whose domains intersect okay then the compatibility condition is that this uh, this function that you can write down for these two charts which is called the transition function okay 
should be holomorphic. So, uh, this g alpha beta is called the transition function. And you put this condition that g alpha beta is holomorphic, then it becomes very nice. It's, uh, it becomes, uh, uh, it's also enough to guarantee that g alpha beta is actually an isomorphism, holomorphic isomorphism, because the it's already a homeomorphism, so it's injective. And I told you that an injective holomorphic map is an isomorphism onto its image, and the inverse map is also holomorphic. So uh, this g alpha beta is holomorphic will automatically imply that g alpha beta inverse which you can check is g beta alpha uh, is also holomorphic. So you get this also okay if you reverse the roles of alpha and beta you can similarly define g beta alpha and you will find that g beta alpha is nothing but g alpha beta inverse okay and uh, well uh, and why is it that this compatibility uh, is going to help us it is going to help us because you see if I take uh, uh, now if I take uh, if I look at f circle phi alpha inverse and if I compose it with uh, g alpha beta I will end up with f circle phi beta inverse you see. So I have this expression and what does this expression say it says very clearly that since this g alpha beta is an isomorphism it says that this is holomorphic if and only if that is holomorphic. And therefore, the holomorphicity of this is equivalent to the holomorphicity of that, and that's exactly what I want. I want the holomorphicity to if it if it is holomorphic with respect to one chart, then I want that it should also be holomorphic with respect to any other chart which intersects this chart. Okay. So that condition is the compatibility condition, and that compatibility condition ensures that the holomorphic nature of a function is intrinsic; it doesn't depend on the chart. Okay. That's the whole point, and that's that's where the so-called transition functions come in. Okay, so uh, shows so this equation shows that uh, the the holomorphicity of f uh, defined as that of f circle phi alpha inverse or of f circle phi beta inverse are consistent okay. So you define f to be holomorphic that if f circle phi alpha inverse is holomorphic or you define f to be holomorphic if f circle b phi beta inverse is holomorphic these three these these two definitions are going to be consistent okay that is because the difference uh, is uh, captured by a transition function which I have made it which I have required uh, to be a holomorphic uh, isomorphism okay fine so now let me uh, so let me again uh, tell you uh, very quickly that when you have this uh, this collection of charts which uh, consist of com consists of pairwise compatible charts okay so you must notice that compatibility has to be checked only when two charts intersect okay so for any two charts that intersect okay so uh, <coughs> whenever any two charts intersect if they are compatible and if I have a collection of charts that cover then I say that x is uh, now a Riemann surface okay. I say that this the surface x has been given the structure of a Riemann surface okay. Now this collection of charts this collection of compatible charts has a special name for it it is called an atlas okay it is called a complex atlas. So uh, uh, a collection of compatible charts that that covers x is called a complex atlas for x and so now you can uh, say it in a jiffy that uh, the surface x is endowed with the structure of Riemann surface if you can find for it a complex atlas. So uh, our definition of uh, a Riemann surface structure on a surface uh, on a surface X is uh, just reduced to finding uh, an, a complex atlas for that surface. All right. So now, having said this, of course, this definition 
uh, needs to be improved a little bit more formally but essentially this is the content of what a Riemann surface is okay. So I will get into details uh, in the coming lectures okay. So uh, there are uh, certain conditions for example I must always assume X to be connected okay and uh, if I am assuming X to be a surface uh, 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 which is an abstract surface then I will have to define what an abstract surface is okay. So what you must understand is that at the moment I am just thinking of surfaces which I can uh, which I can really visualize in three dimensions and I am thinking of trying to make them into Riemann surfaces but then if I want to uh, take uh, uh, take an abstract surface and uh, make it into a Riemann surface then I will have to first define what an abstract surface is. So I will have to define what a uh, two di uh, I have to make sure that this abstract surface is something that is two dimensional because the surface is always two dimensional and then this will lead me into some technicalities okay. So I am uh, such a definition is possible but I do not want to get into that now we will get into that in later lectures. So for the moment let us take this working definition and try to look at some examples okay. So there are some examples and uh, connected with these examples there are some theorems which are really striking uh, which are deep theorems but already they are quite striking okay. So uh, let us look at some examples. So here is here is example 1. Here is example 1. I take x to be uh, the, the real plane, the xy plane, okay. And uh, uh, well, I take uh, the atlas for x to be consisting of just one chart, okay. So, you know, every chart contains an open set and a map, all right okay and the open set I take it to be all of X <coughs> that is I take it to be all of R2 I take the whole plane okay and the map phi mind you has to be a map from U into C okay and but U is of course R2. So this map from R2 to C what is a map it is a natural map it is an identification map and what is that map it is just taking X comma Y to X plus IY. So this is a natural identification of the plane uh, of the real plane with the argon plane okay this is a natural identification okay and of course this map is uh, homeomorphism this is this is of course uh, continuous and the inverse is also continuous this is the identity map okay. So uh, essentially this is the identity map from R2 to R2 the target R2 being thought of as a complex as a complex plane so this is homeomorphism of course and therefore this pair u comma phi is a chart and you see it is it it covers x because uh, uh, the domain of the chart is already all of x. So one chart is enough one chart is enough and well um, to say that this is an atlas I should also check the so called compatibility <coughs> condition but then there is no compatibility condition need that needs to be checked here because the compatibility condition needs to be checked only when you have two charts which intersect and there is only one chart so there is nothing to check so it is vacuously true okay. So this becomes a complex atlas okay and what happens is that well uh, uh, with this complex atlas R2 becomes a Riemann surface. So with this complex atlas R2 becomes a Riemann surface and what is that Riemann surface it is just the complex plane okay. So the so we say that the complex plane is Riemann sur surface structure on R2 given by the natural identification this is the natural identification okay. So <coughs> uh, uh, hence the, the complex plane C2 is a Riemann surface structure. on R2 given by the standard identification of R2 with okay. So uh, uh, and well uh, what is the meaning of a holomorphic function? 
So uh, a function f on the Riemann surface is going to be a function of two variables real variables x and y if you call it as f of x comma y when is it holomorphic it is holomorphic if you write x plus i y as z and express that function as a function of z it has to be holomorphic. So it is a function on R2 that is holomorphic is actually a holomorphic function uh, in the usual sense okay. So, uh, so the uh, holomorphic functions functions on x are simply the holomorphic functions on on complex plane okay. So uh, if 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 I, if I want to expand on that so let me rub this side just for the sake of clarity so if I have from so so my x is r2 and suppose I have an f a function f into c which is given by uh, f is equal to f of x comma y for x comma y a point in r2 when do I say it is holomorphic by my definition of holomorphicity well I take this uh, this chart that identifies uh, x comma y with z with z is x plus i y okay and then I have to take this composition if I take this composition what I will get is uh, it, it is just uh, trying to write f as a function of z okay f here is written as a function of x and y and if I take this composition okay this composition is uh, uh, to be very strict I should write phi inverse uh, followed by f so let me rub this out and let me write it very clearly. So I have phi inverse followed by f if I write this I get uh, that is nothing but f written in terms of z where z is x plus i y and saying that uh, this f is holomorphic is the same as trying to say that write f as a function of z and it should be holomorphic. So it is the usual definition okay it is the usual definition you do not get anything new okay. So this is the simplest example right uh, you had a question. <coughs> Oh yeah, this this should be C. Sorry, thanks. That should be C. C two is not the complex plane. C. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, well, now now uh, we can ask the following question. So you look at this this line very carefully. It says, well, the complex plane C is a Riemann surface structure on R. So look at is a Riemann surface structure. So the question comes: <coughs> Can I give uh, to R two some other Riemann surface structure, which is different from the usual complex plane structure? And that's what uh, the second example is going to tell you. Okay, the, the answer to that is yes. So let us look at the second example. So here is my example. So again, uh, my x is R two, is the real plane. Okay. And well, the atlas for X is uh, again consisting of only one chart, u comma phi, only one complex coordinate chart, and uh, uh, where u is of course X, and uh, uh, which is R two, and phi now is going to be slightly different. Phi is going to be from uh, u to C. Okay. So, uh, if I take any x comma y, what is uh, it going to go to? Well, here I send x comma y to x plus i y, which is z. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to send it to z by one plus mod z. Okay. So which means what it means is I'm going to send it to x by one plus root of x squared plus y squared plus i times y by 1 plus root of x squared plus y squared this is what I am going to send it to okay. So here is my map my map from u to c 
is the map that sends x comma y to this complex number right so the, so the complex number is z by 1 plus mod z where z is the usual expressive so I am not sending x comma y to the to z but to something else okay now you can check that this is a homeomorphism it is easy to see so let me rub off this diagram you have a question modulus of the function value is always less than or equal to modulus of z divided by exactly the exactly but exactly but that is the point so how it will be a homeomorphism no mind you a coordinate map is supposed to be only a homeomorphism on to the image which is an open set so it should be a the, the when you take a coordinate map it should be from an open subset of the surface to an open subset of the complex plane it need not be the whole of the complex plane okay so now what I have done is you know what I am trying to do I am trying to map the whole complex plane onto the unit disc open unit disc you see that is what is happening so you see uh, you can see the image of phi is contained in uh, the unit disc which is given by the set of all uh, complex number z whose modulus is strictly less than 1 okay that is because if I take the modulus of uh, this complex number z by 1 plus mod z that is always going to be less than 1 okay. So the image of this goes into the unit disc and in fact the and in and in, and in fact you can check you can check that uh, uh, the image of phi is actually the unit disc okay with inverse with inverse map uh, phi inverse this is from the disc back to u mind you u is r2 okay and what is a map it is just you send z to I think uh, uh, z by 1 minus z so let me just check it for a moment z by 1 minus mod z so this is the map and and when I write it like this I mean that you will have to re you have to change this back into uh, uh, you know x y so that means you should write this as x by 1 minus root of x squared plus y squared comma y by 1 minus root of okay so this is the inverse map and you can check that this is indeed in this is indeed the inverse map because you see I start with x comma y it goes to z by 1 plus mod z where I take where as usual I take z equal to x plus i y okay now if I take z plus z by 1 plus mod z in here instead of z if I replace z by z by 1 plus mod z okay then this expression will simplify to z you can see that okay so z by 1 plus mod z will therefore go to z by 1 plus mod z by 1 minus modulus of z by 1 plus mod z if I simplify this I will get so this will be z by 1 plus mod z so let me put a bracket around it so that there is no confusion and here <coughs> if I simplify this I will get 1 by 1 plus mod z so that will be equal to z and that is just x comma y so it is indeed the inverse map okay so what I have proved is is that this map phi is a homeomorphism uh, of the whole plane onto the unit disc okay phi is phi is is a homeomorphism of uh, R2 on to u on to delta okay so well uh, again I am in good shape see I have uh, I have one chart and uh, therefore it is an atlas because I do not have to worry about uh, compatibility so I have got a Riemann surface now is this Riemann surface the same as the complex plane it is not because why is it not the same as the complex plane because let us try to understand what is a holomorphic function on this Riemann surface okay what is a holomorphic function function on this Riemann surface structure
what is the holomorphic function on this Riemann surface structure uh, uh, on this of on on this Riemann surface structure on R2 what is what is a holomorphic function. So, let us let us go back to the definition and you will be surprised <coughs> and I am hoping that it will remind you of a, an important theorem in uh, in uh, in complex uh, function theory. <coughs> so, you see you have so you know so here is my uh, Riemann surface it is R2 ok my chart is from this into the unit disc this is my homeomorphism. So, I put this this symbol to say that it is a homeomorphism or if that confuses you maybe uh, <coughs> well that is ok. Now suppose I have a function f a complex valued function when is <coughs> when is a, a f is holomorphic if and only if this composition which is first apply phi inverse followed by f is holomorphic ok. But what is phi inverse followed by f? See f circle phi inverse of z is f of phi inverse of z but I have a formula for phi inverse of z it is f of z by 1 minus mod z. So, it is f of z by 1 minus mod z ok and well uh, what is this going to be? This is going to be uh, uh, and well um, uh, if I want to be so so what it means is that my f is just a now f is just a function of x and y. So, I will have to write this f of well x by 1 minus root of x square plus y square uh, comma y by 1 minus root of x square plus y square. So, I should write f like this. So, you see what has happened the function now is not the function x comma y going to f of x comma y because of this chart it has become the function x comma y going to f of x by 1 minus root of x square plus y square y by 1 minus root of x square 1 minus y square it is no longer the same function x comma y going to f of x comma y. And if this is uh, uh, holomorphic th I want this to be holomorphic ok I want this to be holomorphic. So, so you know uh, this is holomorphic in if and only if this function is holomorphic, but then let us test ok test with f is equal to the identity map identification which is just uh, that is uh, that is f of x comma y is equal to x plus i y that is z this is just the natural identification map ok. So, uh, then you see you will get then you will get f then the condition will be that f of z by 1 minus mod z it will be simply z by 1 minus mod z right and uh, then this has to be holomorphic. but it is not f of z going to z by 1 minus mod z is not holomorphic that is because uh, you can see that this mod z is is square root of z z bar and you know that the moment a z bar term comes the function cannot be holomorphic the partial derivative of f with respect to z bar has to be 0. So, z going to z by 1 minus mod z is not holomorphic ok. So, what you have done is on R2 you have put a Riemann surface structure such that the natural identity map becomes non holomorphic. So, you see it is a completely different structure. So, this structure uh, of Riemann surface in R2 is not the standard structure, it is a new structure, and guess what? It is nothing but it is a Riemann surface structure on the unit disc. After all, you are identifying R2 with the unit disc, and it is the complex structure on the unit disc that you are transport transporting to R2, ok. So, what you have done is you have made R2 into Riemann surface isomorphic to the unit disc all right but then you know the unit disc is not equivalent to the complex plane that is your famous riemann mapping theorem okay it says that any uh, if you look at the open uh, simply connected uh, subsets of the complex plane there are only two isomorphism classes one is the whole plane and anything else is isomorphic to the unit disc and these two are different so what i have done is by this map i have forced the structure of riemann surface on the unit disc to be stretched to the whole plane 
and so it is not the standard structure on the whole complex plane okay so that is why uh, i am getting uh, another structure on the complex on on r2 okay which is not the standard structure okay so but it is not so so let me just complete this so this is a different structure from example 1 okay so the remark is that uh, you can still look at uh, the uh, uh, the situation when uh, uh, i mean the situation that is described by the riemann mapping theorem okay so uh, let's now go into the next example which is um, well trying to <coughs> make uh, uh, which is trying to make the sphere into a Riemann surface okay. Uh, so um, before I uh, uh, before I do that let me add uh, add a remark okay. So uh, this is the probably the right point uh, to add the following remark. So uh, the remark is a very deep theorem. So it's called the theorem. It's part of what is called the as the uniformization theorem. So let me state that. So uh, uniformization theorem. Any simply connected non-compact. Riemann surface has to be isomorphic to either the unit disc or to the whole complex plane. So uh, what this will tell you is that if I uh, try to attempt to put various uh, Riemann surface structures on the plane I will only succeed uh, in getting two which are essentially different one will be the whole complex plane itself the standard structure the other one will is the structure that I have written down here you cannot get anything more okay. Well the proof of this theorem is a little deep okay and uh, essentially it can be in a way reduced to the Riemann mapping theorem right uh, but uh, I'm, I'm in this course I'm trying I'm going to point out some important theorems uh, at the right time uh, not to uh, be worried about giving the proof of the theorem immediately but to just to, to, to tell you what is true okay, for the so that you get a feel of what is true okay. So what this if you believe this uniformization theorem it's not the full uniformization theorem it's still a part of the uniformization theorem. Uh, so here what I have said is I have said that uh, the Riemann surface should be connected and non-compact okay. Now of course you know what connected means topologically uh, that it cannot be written as a disjoint union of uh, uh, open sets simply connected of course means that uh, any closed loop can be continuously shrunk to a point which means that there are no holes on the surface and uh, non-compact is also something that you know the condition is that it should not be closed and, and bounded if you if you visualize it as a subset of uh, R3 okay. So well uh, this is the uniformization theorem and if you believe this it is very clear uh, that uh, you can uh, deduce that you see the uh, uh, the only two possible Riemann surface structures that you can force on the complex plane are one uh, are, the, are the complex plane itself which is given by example 1 by the standard identification okay and the second one is the Riemann surface structure on the unit disc okay these are the only two possibilities you cannot get any more okay. In other words you try to force any Riemann surface structure on R2 it will either be isomorphic to C as a Riemann surface or it will be isomorphic to the unit disc as a Riemann surface that is all you will get okay. So it is a deep theorem now let me go to example. Uh, example 3 which is trying to make the sphere into a Riemann surface. So make making 
the sphere sphere into a Riemann surface well um, so here I am um, so so let me let me draw a diagram so that it's uh, it's easier for me to to explain how the charts look like so so I take a three dimensional space okay and well I have the unit sphere here the three dimensional space so this is the unit sphere I call this the this is my x axis this is my y axis well and I won't call the third one as the z axis I'll call it as the u axis because I want z to be uh, x plus i y that is I want the the x y plane to still represent the complex plane okay and uh, that is why I am not calling the third axis as the z axis so I am calling the third coordinate as u okay and well this is this this is the this is the sphere s2 and of course you know this is the north pole n this is the south pole and you know the coordinates the north pole is 0 comma 0 comma 1 south pole has coordinates 0 comma 0 comma minus 1 okay and well to make this to make the sphere into a Riemann surface I have to give you uh, an atlas an atlas is therefore going to be a collection of charts which are pairwise compatible whenever they intersect and what I am going to do now is give you an atlas consisting of exactly two charts okay and what are the, what are the two charts the two charts are as follows so uh, atlas for x equal to s2 so this is my x now is it consists of let me write this u1 comma p1 and u2 comma p2 and let me tell you what u1 u2 p1 p2 are well so u1 uh, is the sphere minus the north pole and u2 is the sphere minus the south pole okay and the map p1 from u1 to the complex plane is nothing but the stereographic projection from the north pole so this is the stereographic projection projection from from n and similarly the map from p2 to c is going to be the stereographic projection projection from the south okay so uh, well let me quickly recall this you I am I am sure you have seen this in a first uh, course in complex analysis how the uh, Riemann sphere is constructed okay so uh, it is well you take any point on the sphere p and what is the stereographic projection from the north pole well you uh, uh, you just join this point to the point p you get a straight line and that line is going to go and hit the complex plane which is the x y plane thought of as a complex plane at a certain point uh, let me call this as uh, uh, and, uh, it at a certain point which I call as p1 of p okay that is the stereographic projection from the north pole okay and similarly what is the stereographic projection from the south pole well again you take a point q on the sphere the Riemann sphere mind you this is given by uh, the, the algebraic equa equation x squared plus y squared plus u squared equal to 1 of course just to recall so I am taking a point Q <coughs> with coordinates which satisfy this equation and well what is the stereographic projection I join the south pole to this point and it is going to come up and going to hit the plane somewhere okay and I call that as P2 of Q okay so uh, so you see so in other words P1 of P is equal to uh, interest point of point of intersection of n p or p n with x y plane and similarly p 2 of p 
phi 2 of q is point is a point of intersection of uh, s q with the x y plane. So, these are the standard Cedar graphic projections and well uh, you can easily check you you have already seen this I suppose in a course in complex analysis in the first course in complex analysis that both stereogra both stereographic projections are isomorphisms they are homeomorphisms of uh, uh, the Riemann sphere minus the pole onto the whole complex plane. So, these are of course homeomorphisms okay. So, uh, both u1 comma phi1 and u2 comma phi2 are certainly charts and u1 and u2 of course cover the whole sphere. So, you you have a charts that cover the whole sphere the only thing that you will have to worry about is uh, to make this really an atlas you have to check that the compatibility condition holds. So, well uh, you can check check that uh, uh, the, the, the compatibility condition condition holds and what is the compatibility condition you take u1 intersection u2 okay and uh, uh, so yeah so the compatibility condition will come from uh, um, so u1 intersection u2 will be uh, the Riemann sphere minus both the north pole and the south pole okay and you can see that uh, uh, phi 1 of u1 intersection u2 is just the complex plane minus the the, uh, uh, the origin <coughs> okay and uh, uh, because uh, phi 1 is going to uh, map uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, sphere except the north pole onto the complex plane and if you remove the south pole okay then from the Im image you are removing the origin okay. and uh, you can see also that phi 2 similarly of u1 intersection u2 is again the complex plane minus the origin okay. So, in both cases the image of this intersection is the so called punctured plane the plane minus the origin and therefore, you get a transition function from uh, the punctured plane to itself and I will have to check that this transition function is holomorphic and you can check that the transition function uh, is, is has a very simple form in this case. Namely the transition function function which will go from c minus 0 to c minus 0 the transition function is simply z going to 1 by z you can check that you can I want you to write it down and check that this is the transition function and this is of course holomorphic is of course which is simply which is of course holomorphic well as a result of this uh, we have been able to give a Riemann surface structure on the sphere okay. Well coming to think of it probably uh, you will have to compose either phi 1 or phi 2 with the complex conjugation to get it uh, get it right. So, you have to figure that out writing it down yourselves okay and this uh, this Riemann surface structure on the sphere is called the Riemann sphere okay this is what. So, this this Riemann surface structure structure on S2 is called the Riemann sphere okay. Well uh, let me end by uh, giving you another interesting result see in the first and first and second examples we saw that we were able to give two different Riemann surface structures on the plane okay and then the uniformization theorem said that these are the only ones possible okay. Now you can ask the same question take the real sphere I have already proved that there is one Riemann surface structure can you give more okay. So, there is a theorem it is again part of the uniformization theorem which says that this is not possible you can on this on the on the real sphere S2 
any structure of Riemann surface that you impose on it will be isomorphic to this one. So, you have no freedom. Okay. So, this is also, uh, so let me state this uniformization theorem. Any simply connected compact Riemann surface has to be isomorphic to the Riemann sphere. So, it is a beautiful theorem. It tells you that you no matter what, uh, no matter how many charts you use and no matter how many atlases you try to manufacture on the real sphere, if you put a Riemann surface structure, it has to be isomorphic to this one. You do not have any more freedom. Okay. So, this is again a deep theorem, it is part of the uniformization theorem. This and that statement put together are, are called as the first uniformization theorems. This is for non compact simply connected. Uh, case and this is for the compact simply connected case okay and this is again a deep theorem okay so uh, i'll uh, stop with that Thank you.